So I opened uh, Revm in VS Code, and I think the best way to cover EIP 7702 here is to go through a uh, full transaction uh, lifecycle and look at every line of code that has changed due to EIP 7702. All right, just to give you a quick overview of Revm, this EVM struct here is the main data structure. It has two fields, the context and the handler. The context is basically responsible for everything which is state related or environment related. And the handler, everything which uh, relates to logic, execution, and so on. Furthermore, the EVM exposes transact method, which basically handles incoming transactions and executes them. And we'll follow the logic of this method in order to um, identify what has changed under EIP 7702. All right, so the first thing that happens here is that we call this pre-verify uh, transaction inner with does some pre-validations on the transaction. And first thing is we call this validate env method on the validation handler. So this just brings us to the interface, what you call a trade in Rust, but we want uh, the actual implementation for Ethereum mainnet. So we'll have a look um, here. And here we can see that we do a bunch of things. We'll ignore everything which is not EIP 7702 related. Then we call it validate transaction environment. And then we can see we have a first conditional here coming up based on the transaction type. As already mentioned in the, the introduction video of EIP 7702, EIP 7702 introduces a new transaction type. So we can see here that we have some specific validation that happens specifically for this type of transaction. So here the first thing we do is that we check if we are post uh, the Prague upgrade. P Prague is the Ethereum upgrade that will bring EIP 7702 with it. If uh, we are pre-Prague, this type of transaction should not be supported. Uh, we return an error. Then we check chain ID stuff, but we do that for other transactions as well. So let's ignore that. Then we do some gas fee stuff. But this is also not related to EIP 7702. You can see the gas kind of validation uh, for priority fees and so on is the same that we do for EIP 1559 transactions. Um, the first thing that is specific and that we're interested in here is this part. So here we check, as I already mentioned in the first video, the EIP 7702 transaction type includes an authorization list with a bunch of authorizations that were given by externally owned account owners to upgrade their externally owned account. Then what we do is here is we take that list and we check that this list contains at least one authorization because this is what has been specified by the EIP. All right, returning to our pre-verified transaction inner method and looking at the next line, which is a call on the validation handle of this method validate initial transaction gas. This basically calculates how much gas this transaction will uh, require and returns early if it's less than what the gas limit of the transaction specified. And we can ignore this. There's nothing EIP 7702 related here. Next, we call validate transaction against uh, state. So here what we do is we get the account um, from the day from from the DB of of the caller and pass it to this validate transaction against account. And within this method, we can see that there's a, another conditional based on uh, whether the bytecode is an EIP 7702 bytecode and. That stems from uh, the fact that we do a check here, which was introduced by EIP 3607, which wants to make sure that the account that originates, uh, that sends the transaction to the blockchain, is uh, not a smart contract, but an EOA. And historically, that was defined by uh, an empty bytecode because only externally owned account had uh, an empty bytecode. But now externally owned account can also have bytecode, but only a very specific type of bytecode, which is this delegation designator bytecode, which was uh, defined by uh, EIP 7702 to identify an externally owned account as smart account. So basically what happens here is that we are making sure that either the uh, bytecode of the calling account that originated this transaction is uh, empty or has a non-empty uh, code field, but then uh, that code field has to be of type um, EIP 7702 in the format of this delegation designator. And otherwise we uh, reject transaction. But yeah, in the first video, the introduction to this one, we looked at what this uh, delegation designator uh, bytecode looks like for an EIP 7702 upgraded externally owned account. Now let's uh, look at what this looks like. So what is EIP 7702 checks? 
is that it returns, I mean, it returns true if the bytecode is in line with the format of the delegation designator uh, specified by EIP 7702. So let's look at what that looks like. So we have this uh, bytecode enum with the EIP 7702 variant, which uh, wraps this EIP 7702 struct. So this struct has a delegated address field, which is the address of the smart contract wallet the EOA wants to delegate to, a version field and the raw bytes, which is basically the byte code that since sits under the code field in an externally owned account under EIP 7702. Let's look at how this is being constructed by looking at the new method here. So first off, we push these these EIP 7702 magic bytes, this prefix of uh, EF01 in hex. Then we push the version number, which is zero initially, and then we concatenate it with the the address, uh, the delegation address, and that's how we get the raw bytes. So these raw bytes shouldn't be no longer than 23 bytes because uh, we had two bytes here, which are the EIP 7702 magic bytes. The version number is another byte and the address, as we know, an Ethereum address is 20 bytes. So this should be 23 bytes maximum len. And this check is also being done here in the this alternative constructor method, which takes in the raw bytes as an argument instead of the address and uh, returns an error if it's the raw bytes are not 23 bytes long. So let's return to this uh, validate transaction against account where we left off from. And we've seen what an EIP 7702 bytecode looks like. So yeah, the further logic here doesn't relate to EIP 7702, so we can ignore that. So let's return to our pre-verified transaction in the where we left off from earlier. And we can see that after that, uh, we only return the initial gas spent that was calculated earlier to our transact method here. So next we call the transact pre-verified inner method, which uh, basically is the main function that handles, yeah, executing the transaction and so on after the pre-validation that we just did has been completed. So the first few things that are being done here can be ignored. We're doing stuff like warming up accounts and deducting some gas costs from the caller. Then we adjust the gas limit. However, here we do something uh, which is obvi obviously very much uh, related to EIP 7702. So let's look at that in detail. In that we apply the EIP 7702 auth list. Uh, so what does that mean? If you can recall from the first video, EIP 7702 introduces a new transaction type that includes an auth list, which is a list of individual authorizations. And applying this list uh, basically means uh, setting all these de this special delegation designation bytecode under the uh, code field of uh, an EOA to make it identifiable as a smart account. So here again, we are led to the trade and not the actual implementation. So let's look at the actual implementation for Ethereum mainnet. So here it is, apply EIP 7702 auth list. Yeah, there we get the implementation. So what do we do here? Uh, first, we check if this transaction is actually an EIP 7702 transaction. Then we transform this authorization list into a, a vector of uh, authoriz of our auth local authorization type. And so this authorization type has an authority field, which is an option of the EOA address that wants to get upgraded, then the address to which it wants to uh, delegate to, the, the smart contract address of the smart contract wallet, and then a nonce and a chain ID. So next is that we loop each authorization of that uh, authorization list. Yeah, keep in mind that any kind of EOA can send uh, an, app, uh, an, up, uh, an authorization list with authorizations that have been been signed by a given EOA owners that want to upgrade their account. That is, the EOA that wants to upgrade itself doesn't have to be the sender of that authorization list. Someone can, for example, uh, batch a bunch of authorizations into that list and upgrade uh, them all. But all these uh, authorizations have to be signed by the given EOA owner. So what do we do for when we loop through these authorizations? First, we check that the auth chain ID is either zero or it's equal to the chain ID of that has been configured um, in this EVM instance. If it's not, then we move on to the next authorization in the list. Um, then we check the nonce in the authorization that has to be that uh, cannot be equal to uh, U64 max 
because if it is and we increment it later, then that would overflow. Um, yeah, um, so if it is, then we move on to the next authorization and don't handle this one. The next check is to check whether the authority, that is the, um, as we said, the EOA address, which has signed permission to uh, upgrade its EOA to a smart account. We check if it's not none and that it's uh, some instead. Because um, if it's none, um, then it means the uh, signature verification has failed. And the signature verification happens on the node level before the uh, transaction enters uh, EVM execution. So if it's a valid signature and the EOA has actually given permission to upgrade its account, then we get uh, the authority address here and uh, continue execution. If it was a not valid, valid signature, then we skip this authorization and move on to the next one. So next we then load the authority's account from the database and get its state like uh, the nonce, its code field and all that stuff. Then we verify that uh, the code uh, on that account is either empty or is an EIP 7702 delegation designator bytecode we've seen before because otherwise uh, it would mean that uh, for some reason this is a smart contract with uh, some bytecode. In that case, we don't want to handle the authorization and move on to the next one. Then we check that the uh, nonce that was specified in the authorization is equal to the nonce on the account, on the account state. If it's, if it's not, then we move on to the next authorization and uh, skip it. Um, all right, this one is actually quite interesting because here we check if the code field under the uh, EOA's account is empty. And if it's not empty, then we um, increment this refunded account counter here. And the reason we do that is that uh, when we upgrade an EOA's account under EIP 7702, there's a different gas, co gas cost that applies whether this account already had a delegation designator bytecode, meaning it was already upgraded in the past, or whether it's being upgraded for the first time. And we can see that there's a the difference between the two is uh, being multiplied here by this refunded accounts counter to refund some gas in case yeah some 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 accounts had already been upgraded in the past and they get re-upgraded to some other functionality now and in terms of gas costs we can see here that if EOA gets upgraded for the first time there's a 25,000 gas cost applied to it and if it's uh, re-upgraded, then it's only 12,500 gas. All right, so next we move on to this, to the most important part of this method, which is actually upgrading the EOA uh, to a smart account. We do that by, first of all, uh, passing the address to which this EOA that gave the authorization wants to delegate to, to this constructor method of the EIP 7702 uh, bytecode that we, we've seen earlier that gives us this delegation uh, designator bytecode. Then we also calculate the hash of that and set it to the EOA, EOA's account state. So once this is done, the account is actually being upgraded. And um, the EIP 7702 also specifies that even if the transaction um, reverts in some way later on during execution, this state actually sticks. So it it's not atomic in the same way that state gets uh, rolled back if, uh, if, if the transaction fails at some point, the way it's done doing a smart, con smart contract execution. Next, we uh, increment the nonce of that EOA's account and uh, we mark it as touch. And then um, this method refunds, uh, returns the refunded gas that we calculated earlier. So I don't know if you can recall this flow here from the, the, the first video, which showed how first during pre-execution, we loop through each authorization in the authorization list that is contained in this new EIP 7702 transaction type and go through a bunch of checks and then set the delegation, the designated delegation code uh, to the EOA's code if all the checks pass. This is basically what we have been doing until now. And only now we move to the main transaction execution. All right, so now we are back from applying this EIP 7702, 7702 auth list and have upgraded all these accounts. And from now on, yeah, the standard execution of a transaction uh, occurs. And this is what I mean by uh, main transaction execution. So all of this happens independently of whether this is a transaction of this new EIP 7702 type or whether this is a normal transaction. In any case, the to field of a transaction specifies the address, uh, the smart contract that uh, we want to call. And the fu function selector in the call letter specifies the function. 
And according to those, we create a first frame here. A first frame is then being executed in this loop. And according to the specific execution of, of the bytecode of the smart contract that is being called, we then uh, create new frames if there are any subcalls and uh, create this call stack and um, execute each frame one after the other. This is how the EVM works and how it executes uh, smart contracts. But we're not really interested into looking into this right now. But we want to think about like what should be EIP 7702 related within that execution. And the obvious thing to look at is obviously to look at what a frame consists of. So let's look at this frame type here. Here we have the, the frame struct and we can see it consists of a bunch of fields. The depth is probably the, the where it lies in the call stack. But what we're interested in is this interpreter. The interpreter is uh, responsible of executing the bytecode of that frame, opcode by opcode and so on. And so it should include the bytecode and it does. And this bytecode is the bytecode of the smart contract that we are calling. Now, if we want to call an, a smart account, um, our upgraded smart EOA smart account, then in the transaction, we specify the to field as our EOA address. And then obviously we don't want the transaction to execute the, the bytecode that is specified under the code of our EOA because that only contains, as we had, have seen already, the delegation designator, this 23 byte long bytecode, which consists of this special prefix, the version number and the delegated address to which, to which we want to delegate the functionality. And so what would make sense is to see when a call is being made to, a, to our EOA that we take that delegation address and then load the bytecode of the actual delegated address into the interpreter when we create the interpreter. And this is actually exactly what's happening when we create a frame, which we can see here under a... So here when a smart contract is being called, we load the, the smart contract specified in the to field of the transaction from the database. Uh, we get back an account and from that account we take the bytecode and the code hash and though both of these are then passed to the interpreter here when we create a new interpreter for the given frame that we return from this function but here's the conditional that we're interested in so the reason this part is obviously important is that this is where we switch the bytecode from being the one that actually sits on your EOA's state, which is just this delegation designator we already looked at, to the bytecode that actually sits on the delegated address that can be found in your delegation designator. So yeah, we check if, we, if, if the bytecode is actually of type EIP7702, meaning, okay, this was a call to an EOA and that EOA is a smart account under EIP7702. So if that's the case, okay, we need to load a different bytecode. So we retrieve the delegated address from that EIP7702 bytecode, load the account from the DB that sits at that address. From that account, we then retrieve the byte runtime bytecode and the code hash, store them in our bytecode and code hash that we pass to the interpreter. Yeah, and this part is what I tried to show earlier on the main transaction execution, which is the only thing that is EIP 7702 related is that, okay, we need to check, is this transaction actually making a call to an EOA? If it is, okay, don't just uh, load this, the runtime bytecode the normal way and start uh, creating a frame and executing it but instead load the delegated code and then proceed to execution and so on. Yep. And this wraps it up really. I really hope this helps to comprehend EIP 7702. I think it's one of the most exciting updates that we've seen for a long time. Please correct me on anything that you think was wrong. I'm, I'm sure there's some stuff I, uh, I've overseen. But yeah, drop comments uh, to correct me or provide any feedback. You're also welcome to join uh, my Discord in which uh, we can discuss anything related to um, this stuff. So yeah, see you around, guys.